before discussing the role of female athletes activism in the 1960s starting with Wilma Rudolph it is important to understand the context of the time the 60s were one of the most turbulent time periods in US history all over the country people of all races genders and abilities were challenging the status quo and trying to dismantle the imperialist white supremacist cap capitalist patriarchy Remembering the sexist standards set by the IOC following the Amsterdam Games in 1928 that prohibited women from competing in the 800-meter run and overall limited participation in track until the 1960 Olympics set the stage for historic Olympic Games. Wilma Rudolph grew up in poverty in rural Tennessee, suffered through the indignities of Jim Crow, and overcame polio en route to becoming the first American woman to win three gold medals at a single Olympic Games. At the Rome 1960 Olympics, Rudolph turned in one of the finest performance ever by an American Olympian. She took gold in one, the 100-200 meter dashes as well as the 4x100 meter relay. Her time in the 100-200 meter broke the world record. In one week, Rudolph laid claim to the title of the fastest woman in the world. Republican presidential candidate Richard Nixon even tried to co-opt her star power to gain popularity with black voters. Yet despite all of this, she was treated as a second-class citizen in her own country and in her own hometown of Clarksville, Tennessee. Although they won gold me medals at the Olympics, they couldn't come back home and not be able to eat in a restaurant. Unlike the athletes of the 1950s, Rudolph engaged in direct action to fight, the ri fight for the rights of African Americans. Protesting at a restaurant in Clarksville that refused to serve blacks, her efforts scored quick results. In less than two weeks, city officials desegregated Clarksville restaurants. Rudolph was one of the four women pictured center who won the 4 by 100 meter relay for the United States. All were Tennessee State runners coached by the legendary Ed Temple. This is where my research led me to uncover one of the most impressive and forgotten pieces of sports history and one of the greatest sports dynasties ever. Tennessee State University Tiger Bells won 34 national championships in 44 years. Between 1956 and 1984, Ed Temple sent Wilma Rudolph along with Wyoma Tyus and 40 other Tiger Bells to the Olympics, where they won 23 medals, 13 gold, 6 silver, and 4 bronze. All of them graduated. 32 received a master's degree and 8 of them went on to earn doctorates. Their success has been unparalleled in NCAA history. They are the winningest track and field team, male or female, in history. Another historic Tiger Bell is Wild Mia Tice. At the 1964 Summer Olympics, in a race for which she was not even expected to qualify, Georgia native Wild Mia Tice emerged as the fastest woman in the world, winning gold in the 100 meters. In the 68 game, she went on to break Wilma Rudolph's record to set a new world one. From the first day of the 68th Summer Olympics in Mexico City, Tice supported the OPHR, the Olympic Project for Human Rights, by wearing black running shorts instead of the team-issued white ones. Tice made history as she leaned forward to cross the finish line just as the rain started to pour. She had just become the first person, male or female, to win back-to-back -back gold medals in the 100-meter races. OPHR, an organization founded ahead of the 68 Games by San Jose State University's Dr. Harry Edwards and Olympians Tommy Smith and John Carlos, was organized for athletes to protest against human rights injustices. Tice was a member, but was also shocked as the rest of the world when at the Games, Smith and Carlos raised their fists in a black power salute during the national anthem on the medal stand after respective 200 gold and bronze finishes. However, Smith and Carlos weren't the only athletes to use the game stage to make a statement. Tice's black shorts were a silent protest. After winning the 4 by 100 meter relay gold medal, her and the entire relay team dedicated their victory to Tommy and Carlos. I am dedicating my medals to them. I believe in what they did, said Tice. To Tice's knowledge, however, her statement of solidarity was never printed anywhere. Why? When she answered, she said, because I am a woman, who cared? Not only Tice's protest nearly unacknowledged, but Smith and Carlos' demonstration also overshadowed her historic Olympics record, record-setting consecutive 100-meter gold finish feats. To this day, half a century later, as she is recognized as one of the greatest American Olympians ever, according to Billie Jean King, most track and field fans hardly know her legacy. 
There was also no fanfare following her historic win. No one brought out banners or draped ties to the American flag. In her book, Tiger Bell, The Wyoma Ties Story, she wrote, At the time, they were not about to bathe a black woman in glory. It would give us too much power, wouldn't it? When people hear the 1968 Olympics, they remember something that took place after Tice made history. Ask Tice to rationalize her hidden figure status, and she bluntly summarizes. At that time, I was competing. There was two main obstacles to me becoming an athlete, being black and being female. Black women and black girls in general get no encouragement from the community, let alone the wire society. As for how she'd like to be remembered for her contributions to history, she said, I'd like for the world to know it is not how fast I ran or how many medals I won. I want to think they remember me as the woman who had given all that she can to offer a, all that she can offer and want to make life a lot easier for other women and the women to come. Vera Chanslovska The athlete activism did not end with Americans Carlos Smith or Tice. Vera Cheslovska, the most successful Czech gymnast in the history of the Olympics, also took a political stand while accepting her medal. Two months before the Games had commenced, the Soviet Union led an invasion into Czechoslovakia in order to crush what was called Prague Spring, moved towards less surveillance and repression that aimed to weaken the Soviet control of the country. The Czechoslovak National Olympic Committee nearly opted to withdraw from the Games, as the conflict made training nearly impossible for athletes and major transatlantic flights were not flying out of Prague. Less than a month before the Games ceremony, Czechoslovakia decided to press ahead and send its athletes to Mexico City. Kazlowska had already established herself as a top gymnast, winning three gold medals and a silver at the Tokyo Games in 64. She had shown herself willing to be an athlete who would speak out by signing the Manifesto of the 2000 Worlds in April of 68, which protested the Soviet actions in so Czechoslovakia. Four months later, the Soviets invaded and Kaslovska fled into hiding where she trained under suboptimal, stressful condition. Despite all of this, Kaslovska shined in Mexico City. She went on to win gold in all-around, vault, uneven bars and floor, becoming the only man or woman to win every individual Olympic title in gymnastics. In the process, she beat out arch-rival Soviet gymnasts to the ecstatic cheers of local spectators. Only days after Carlos and Smith thrust their fists skyward, Chavzlowska made her own political stand on the medal scan. Picture top left, she is dipping her head in silent protest during the Russian national anthem. I am a Czechoslovak citizen, she later said. We all tried hard to win in Mexico because it would turn the eyes of the world on our unfortunate country. She paid the price for her stand. The Soviet complaint department in Prague forbade her from traveling abroad and competing in gymnastics. Years later, Chavzlowska would become the head of the Czech National Olympic Committee, as well as the eighth woman co-opted as a member of the IOC. Her story is still yet to be recognized. Catherine Switzer While Vera and Weil Mia were protesting at the Olympics, 20-year-old Syracuse University junior Catherine Switzer became the first woman to officially enter and run the Boston Marathon. Pictured centered and right is the famous photo of a race official being blocked by Thomas Miller as the official is trying to forcibly remove Catherine Switzer from the Boston Marathon that occurred on April 19, 1967. That life-defining day inspired her to create greater opportunities for women in sports, including organizing an international running circuit of women's races, being instrumental in having the women's marathon accepted in the Olympic Games, and establishing 261 Fearless, a global nonprofit to empower women through running. Switzer, who graduated from Newhouse School of Public Communications and the Carves of Office Sciences, has been recognized for her activism in advancing women's sports, health, and equality. Among her many honors, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 2011 and in the inaugural class of the National Distance Running Hall of Fame in 98. Legacy. Pictured here is a new Beats ad featuring Naomi Osaka, world number one tennis player and current U.S. Open champion. Throughout history, women have risked their careers and paid the price of using their athletic platform to call out human rights injustices. However, historically, their accomplishments and protests have gone unreported, and it is beyond time for that to change. At this year's U.S. Open, Naomi Osaka, Japanese tennis great, walked onto the court wearing masks with the names of African Americans killed by police. 
seven masks for each of her U.S. Open matches. The masks bore the names of Brianna Taylor, Elijah McClain, Ahmad Arbery, Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, Philando Castell, and Tamir Rice, Rice being the last mask for the final. At the U.S. Open presentation ceremony, she was asked about what message she wanted to deliver by wearing those masks to the matches, and Osaka replied sharply, saying it was more important to know what message people got. What was the message that you got? That's the question. That's the point, is to make people start talking, she said. She joins a long line of female tennis champion activists like Serena and Venus Williams, Billie Jean King, and the all-great Althea Gibson. The WNBA Tennis is not the only sport that female athletes are demonstrating historic activism. The WNBA, who have long been among the most effective and persistent activists in sports, are little recognized for it. Nearly two months before the NBA announced its social justice coalition, the WNBA had launched its own version. Players decide to get it, dedicate their season to Breonna Taylor, the 26-year-old EMT who was killed by police when they entered her home in Louisville, Kentucky. After police shot James Blake seven times in the back, the WNBA's Washington Mystics walked down to the court wearing shirts that together spelled out James's name with seven red circles in the back of each shirt drawn to look like a bullet hole, pictured left. The players pushed their league to postpone its scheduled games as well. This, is just, this isn't just about basketball. We aren't just basketball players, Washington Mystics guard R.L. Atkins told ESPN. We're going to say what we need to say. The WNBA has a long history of activism from gun violence to abortion rights to police brutality. Minnesota Lynx star Maya Moore, an Olympian in the prime of her career, left the league last year to push for the release of, from prison of a wrongly convicted man named Jonathan Irons. He was free in July. WNBA players raise their voices even when the stakes are doing so are so high, and they've scored tremendous results. Nikki Ogomike, an all-star forward for the Los Angeles Sports and president of the WNBA's Players Union, said, When we talk about playing and not playing, the implications that it has on female basketball player relative to male player, basketball player are dire. She is speaking to the revenue differences in the leagues. By all means, we should continue applauding the WNBA players for joining the fight. But let's be sure to remember the women who were there, who have been there, rolling up their sleeves and showing everyone how to get it done despite making less money and getting less attention for their troubles historically and currently.